church family. It is so good to be back with you again on this Lord's Day morning. We are so blessed to have you joining us today. Uh, this is our last time we're going to be doing this uh, service in this particular method. In fact, uh, beginning next Sunday, we're going to start worshiping in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, so be sure and mark your calendars and be ready for that on Sunday, June 14th. And we'll be here at 10 o'clock only, no Bible classes. We'll still do sunshine studies for the little ones. But uh, we'll meet here at 10 o'clock. And we understand if you're worried about uh, your health or any other issues and you're not able to come, we'll still do the live stream. But we are going to practice social distancing, and we're going to give you a heads up on how that service will go in the near future. Just watch the Facebook page. This morning, I want to begin by recognizing a passage from Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning at verse 18, Paul says, Be filled with the Spirit. Then he says in verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning in our time together, we will sing songs, we will pray, we will hear a message from the Word of God. We'll also commune around the Lord's table and we'll collect our offering as we're instructed to do on the first day of the week. But we hope that this, this service will be a blessing to you and that we can do it in spirit and in truth. Let's pray together and then we'll get started. Father God, we thank you so much for the time we have this morning to join in worship. We are, as a church family, blessed in so many ways, and especially being able to use technology to still stay connected. And we pray that you'll bless us. Bless us as we open our doors next week. And we pray that, Father, that service will just be a wonderful experience for all of us. We pray your blessings upon Ken as he brings the message this morning. And also for those that are participating in the prayers and the singing and everything, Father, we pray it will be a blessing to them and also a blessing to us as we participate. And Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the life that he lived and thank you for his death on the cross. Thank you for his resurrection that brings us hope. And we thank you, Lord, for his ascension that now places him at your right side, interceding for us every time we come before your presence and now reigning as our high priest. We honor you, Lord, and we honor our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are so grateful for the spirit you place inside of us, for your holy word that guides us, and we worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. In Christ. Sing to me.
this time we're going to observe the communion, so if you have your supplies, go ahead and get them ready. I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible, to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to be reading the words of the Apostle Paul this morning, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I love this particular passage because Paul teaches us a couple of different things very plainly. First of all, sometimes we get into a rut or we get into a pattern of doing the same things over and over. And Paul says, I want you to remember that we don't just keep communion, the Lord's Supper, because I'm teaching it to you. It's not just something the New Testament church practiced on the first day of every week. It's something that Jesus himself instructed the church to do. And that's why many times when we take the communion, you'll see on the front of the table, do this in remembrance of me. It's a reminder that Jesus instituted this Last Supper, and he tells us the emblems that are to be used and the specific purpose for them. So this morning, we're going to participate with the bread. We're going to take the bread, and we're going to think about Jesus' body that hangs on the cross for us. Let's uh, spend some time in prayer and observe this part of the Lord's Supper together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and sacrifice his body, which we now take in the form of bread. In Jesus' name, amen. The second part of the Lord's Supper, again instructed by Jesus, is that we participate in taking the cup, which represents his blood. In fact, here in the text in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul reminds the early church that they are doing it because it is a representation of the covenant that God is making with his people. And we're supposed to drink it and think about Jesus' blood. So this morning as we take the cup, I pray that you'll think about the precious blood of Jesus that cleanses us and makes us whole, that continually cleanses us of our sins as we pray and we offer him our lives as a living sacrifice. And so as we observe the cup today, I ask that you would bow your head and join us in prayer and we'll take it together. Please bow. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and all the many blessings that have come with it. And we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. And with that, he shed blood and let us partake of the juice and let it represent the blood of Christ that he shed for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.
after the establishment of the New Testament church, we see a pattern of giving and sharing as people had a need. In fact, it starts as early as Acts 2, and we read on through in Acts 4 and many other places throughout our New Testament that the early church couldn't wait to assemble to collect an offering to give it to those that were in need. In John chapter 15 and verse 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. As we observe communion, we recognize Jesus has given the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life. God, John 3, 16, allowed his one and only son to be crucified so that we might have salvation. We're reminded through the song that we sing oftentimes, I gave my life for thee. We have noticed what Jesus has done. We have prayed about it. We've participated in the communion together. And now it's our opportunity to give back to him, to be able to give back to the work of the church. And so this morning, we're going to lay aside our offering. Hopefully, we've prepared it, planned it. We're ready for this moment. Uh, in just a moment after the prayer, you're going to see three different ways that you can give to help our congregation and the work that we do, which is abundant. We have a lot of great works, as you know. So we need your support and encouragement. And of course, not only are we commanded to do it, we're supposed to do it with a cheerful heart. So we pray that we'll do that this morning. Let's bow together. Lord God, we lay aside our offering today and we pray that we do it with cheerful hearts. And we pray that the money given will be used to grow the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship, 
as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Hello, it's good to see you again. Ray and I were just talking about the fact that this is probably going to be our last telecast, at least over this particular medium. It's been a learning experience, and it seems like just now we've kind of got a handle on it and gotten into a routine. Now we're going to have to come to an end with it, and honestly, we're all very thankful for that. We're looking forward to being together next Sunday, June the 14th, in our own facility. Now, I understand many of you will not yet feel comfortable about coming, and we hope that you'll tune into our live stream. But as far as this particular production is concerned, we're, we're, we're thankful that we're able to put this to an end and be back to a more normal sort of gathering. Today, I want to challenge us from the Word of God about the kind of things that we ought to be committing ourselves to, specifically committing ourselves to the things that we have heard. But before we start our study, let's pray together that God will bless us, okay? Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the blessing of this day. Thank you for all the avenues that we've been able to take this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray, Father, that you will bless us now as we're opening up your word. We, we've already read together a section of the scripture, but Father, help us to focus intently upon those things that we ought to be committed to as Christians. Just empower us, Lord, will you? And Lord, I pray that you'll help me that I can communicate it in a simple, very understandable way. And I pray that those who hear it can easily take these things and make application to their life. Lord, help us to be more committed to you and to the way you do things. Just get our minds right. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, out of that text that we read, I just want us to center our minds on one verse. It's 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul tells Timothy, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these, the words, right? Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, when I mention the Great Commission, we often take our minds back to Jesus ascending to the Father and telling his disciples there in his presence that they're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what we call the Great Commission. But right here in this verse, there is also a kind of Great Commission. It's one that stresses three very serious points. Three points to which every Christian ought to be committed. The purpose of our study this morning will be to look at those three things and to really challenge ourselves to be what God's called us to be, committed to some particular things. Now, the first thing that I want you to notice is that we are to commit to the process of growth. Nick Saban's pretty famous about the process. And every time they go through a year they're building and building hoping to build to a crescendo that will lead with at least the chance for the winning of another national championship but just about every week you'll hear Nick Saban in one of his interviews talking about the process several years ago I was at a kind of convention had several speakers in it one of the speakers was Nick Saban and well, guess what he talked about? <laughs> he talked about the process. Listen, Nick Saban did not invent the process. God has had a process in place for a very, very long time. I want to talk with you for a few minutes about his process of growth. 
Now, you'll notice in this text right here that there are basically four generations that are mentioned. And I don't know if you really got that as we read through it, but open your Bible back to that verse and notice this. Paul says, and the things that you, and he's talking to Timothy, so Timothy's one, the things that you have heard from me, all right, stop right there. We start with Paul, and Paul what he has said, he says, Timothy, you heard this. You heard it among witnesses. There are other people that heard it too. So there's Paul. Paul's communicating his message to Timothy. And then he tells Timothy, well, the things you've heard from me among all these witnesses, you commit them, the things you've heard, to faithful men, and then they'll be able to teach others also. So there's Paul, and then Timothy, and then the faithful men, and then other faithful men. That's four generations, presuming, of course, that that's going to just continue on and on and on and on. That process of growth is something that Jesus initially pointed to as he was ascending to the Father, the Great Commission that I mentioned a moment ago. In Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Don't miss that part where he gives them this great commission. He tells them to make disciples by teaching them the gospel and their obedience. And then he says, you teach them the things that I've commanded you. You see that? Very subtle, but the same idea. Continue the propagation of the gospel. One person to another, going generation after generation after generation. Now again, presumably, that continuing distribution of the gospel from person to person and generation to generation would ultimately come down to you and I. Exactly. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter has preached his gospel sermon. The people's hearts are pricked. They're cut. And so they're crying out to Peter and the other apostles, oh, you know, what shall we do? And so Peter tells them to repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Watch this now. For this promise is to you, and to your children, and to those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Well, he's still calling. <laughs> and so, as the gospel continues to be preached from one generation to the next, that great commission stays in effect. You get that? Started there, Paul says, well, with me, what you hear me preaching, you preach, Timothy. Timothy, you preach that and, and, and commit that to faithful men, and then they'll do the same on and on and on it will go. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful process. It's so beautiful, it's so simple that it can be taken for granted. That is, it can just kind of lay by the wayside. We think, well, you know, everybody else is kind of doing this. Why should I lift a finger in this process? The reason that you should do it is because you're an important part of this process of God. And keep in mind, it is generation to generation to generation. You understand if one generation, well, let's just take ourselves, for instance. If this generation, the one you and I are in, if we fail to do our responsibility, if we fail to commit ourselves to this process of growth, then the same thing that happened as is recorded in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10 could happen to us. What does that text say? Well, it says that there was a generation who rose up that did not know the Lord nor the works he had done in Israel. What happened? The previous generation didn't commit the truth about the Lord to the next generation. And as a result of that, they fell away. And there would be problems with Israel thereafter. You see, we have to be committed to the process of growth that God has established 
Now, how does that work? Well, it's pretty simple. We carry the Word of God, and we plant seeds. That's the idea that's expressed in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. The seed is the Word of God. And when you take that seed and you plant it, you can have great success because it's God's seed. Even in times of persecution and distress, that word can have its effect. I think about how the gospel was first preached there in Jerusalem, and boy, the church in Jerusalem became just a, a powerhouse of evangelism and encouragement. But it seems like, you know what, that, that wasn't God's plan just to stay in Jerusalem. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we find out that the plan is you're going to begin in Jerusalem, then it's going to go to Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, question, how are we going to get it out to the earth if everybody wants to stay in Jerusalem where it just seems easy and comfortable? Well, God used persecution in order to push out the borders of his kingdom. And one passage among several passages is Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. When that persecution came, the Bible tells us that those Christians went everywhere. But what were they doing? Hiding? <laughs> no. They went everywhere preaching the word. You and I, we have to be committed to the process of growth. But we also need to be committed to sharing with others. <clears throat> now, Ken, exactly what would you have me share according to what we find here in this verse? Well, watch it again now. Paul says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these. These what? The things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The things. We have to be committed to sharing, quote unquote, the things. When I, when I saw that here in this text, my mind immediately went to Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, where there is just a piling on of things. He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are pure, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are, are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. The things, just, pure, noble, etc. The things, meditate on that. You notice in verse 9, he says, you, you've, you've heard this stuff from me. You, you've learned, you received, you heard, you saw. You saw them in me, and now you do it. Do you see that connection? It's still that same generational, I've done it, I want to pass that on to you, you do it, and then you pass that on to somebody else. Now, again, as that continues on down the line, where does it eventually end up? Right here. It ends up with me. It ends up with you. Be committed to sharing with others. Sharing what? The things, the things that you have learned, received, and heard, and saw. I, I love the scriptures, and I love the way that they challenge us, they teach us, they motivate us. Now, Jesus looked at this aspect that, that we're talking about right here, just the truth, the, the thing that the truth will do, and it binds us together. For instance, we're going to have all these folks, this, this whole generation, they're going out and they're teaching the things. But what things? Well, they're going to be teaching the same things. All of us are going to be teaching the same things. Jesus prayed for that in John 17, 20, and 21. And I not pray for these alone, but also for all those who are going to believe in me through their word, that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus' program is in place but our continuing in that program is dependent upon several things. And one of those things is our commitment to the one truth. And all of us continuing to preach that same truth over and over and over and over again. Paul emphasized that. Remember, he's telling Timothy what you've heard from me. Well, Paul, where did you get what you say? 
In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, apparently he was challenged about the message that he preached. And he said, you know what? I, I didn't receive this from men, nor was I taught it, but it came by revelation of Jesus Christ. God, through Jesus, had revealed the message to Paul. Peter said essentially the same thing about the deliverance of the word to him in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. He says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we had the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place till the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter's, Peter's suggesting several things here. Number one, he says, I'm an eyewitness. I saw Jesus. I heard the voice of God identifying him as his son. I can testify to that fact. But not only that, I also witnessed Jesus in the fulfilling of many scriptures. And we all understand that the fulfilling of those scriptures, that's not just on the basis of personal interpretation. These are things that God revealed beforehand, things that we ought to be walking in. And so as I, as I saw Jesus and I heard this voice and I interacted with him, I saw the fulfillment of these scriptures. I can say without a doubt that the message that I preach, which was originally spoken by the prophets and now revealed to us as the gospel, the salvation of men, I testify to the fact that it wasn't from me it wasn't some fable that we created, but it was actually out of the mind of God. As Peter had said in his original sermon on the day of Pentecost, it was according to the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Isn't that beautiful? So here we have this, this gospel message. We are wanting to share that with other people. It isn't something that I've developed or that I will teach because I feel comfortable with it. It is a message that I preach because I'm just a conduit through which God's word is to be expressed to another generation so that they can be saved like I've been saved. The gospel is a powerful thing. In fact, Romans 1 verse 16 says that the gospel is God's power to save for the Jew first and also for the Greek. It is for everybody. And the word of God is... Hebrews 4 verse 12 is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You and I as Christians, we're not just committed to the process of growth. We need to be committed to sharing with others. But finally, out of this text, I want us to recognize that we also have to commit to faithfulness. So Paul says to Timothy again, the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others, assuming faithful men also. Commit to faithfulness. Now, Ken, he says right there, faithful men. So I guess us women, we, we are excluded, right? <laughs> Actually, the word that's translated men right there is not the gender-specific word, aner. Actually, it's translated out of the word anthropos, which indicates humanity. Anybody in whom the gospel has been vested has the responsibility, guess what? To be faithful to that word. So Paul tells Timothy, you know what? Whoever it is that you share this gospel with, share it with people who'll be faithful to it, whether they are men or women, and then they can communicate that to other faithful people. People need to hear the gospel. And people need to hear the unadulterated truth. 
And once they've received the unadulterated truth, they can faithfully handle that word to share that with somebody else. That's the idea here. Now, I'm thinking about faithfulness in the handling of the word. We already saw the importance of sharing that word, so that kind of nails down faithfulness to the word of God, don't you think? But I'm also thinking that not only is it the words that we say that impact people. How about this? How about our actions? Our actions communicate our faithfulness very much louder than any words that we say. And I'm wondering, can you say these words with the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1? Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Okay, I look at Paul and say, the Apostle, you know, big time, he's inspired of God. Of course he can say that. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Great. Or Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live. Christ who lives in me, the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Man, that's a, that's a great Christian anthem. Boy, it motivates me. But can you say that? Can you say with Paul, Hey friend, you imitate me as I'm imitating Jesus. Can you say what you're doing is imitating Jesus? When Paul was speaking to Timothy, he did not say, Hey, set me up as a pedestal. You kind of follow what I do. Not just that. Follow what I do as I'm following Christ. So that what? So that you will be doing the same. Right? Don't be another Paul. Be another Jesus. Be like Jesus. What would that mean? Well, he gets really specific there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. He says, don't let anybody despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, conduct, love, spirit, faith, and purity. You be an example. Be like me as I'm being like Jesus for yourself. You be that person so that then you can come along and say, oh, imitate me. As I'm imitating Christ. No, don't imitate me as I imitate Paul imitating Christ. Don't do that. Take out the middleman, Timothy. You be an example on your own. You set the example of a person who's living as Jesus. Now again, let's take that generationally. So the next group of faithful men, what do you think Timothy's telling them? Same thing. You be an example. And then those guys that took it, if they shared that faithfully with the next generation, what are they telling them? Same thing. You guys be faithful. You be committed. Be a great example. Let's carry that on down to right now. It ought to be on our lips all the time. Listen, you know what? Here's what I'd like you to do. Just, just imitate me as I also am imitating Christ. Now, am I influenced by people who taught the gospel to me? Absolutely. You know, sometimes when I'm preaching, for instance, I hear myself saying or almost sounding like people that I really respected in years past. You can't help that. They've made an impression on us. But in the final analysis, what I want to be able to say more than anything else is not that I characterize myself as being a disciple of and then fill in the blank of some great person. They would be appalled. What I want to be able to say is that I am emulating in my own life my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be committed to faithfulness. Faithfulness to the truth. Faithfulness to the truth about Jesus. And not just the words, but that they translate into something in me. Now, I mentioned that this isn't just for men. It's for women, too. It's for everybody. In Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul tells Titus there, okay, now, he's already talked about the, the older men and the older women and the kind of life they're supposed to live. And he says, now, you older women, you teach the younger to love their husband, love their children, be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Stop right there. Why would he say something like that? 
Well, because here are these folks looking at Christians and expecting that Christians, those old goody two-shoes, are going to try and live like Jesus. When they don't, what do they say? They're a bunch of hypocrites. Okay, wait a second. Now, Jesus said, I want you to be one so that the world will know that you sent me. But if I'm living in a way that is different from what Jesus called the unified way, you know, the one way, the one way I want you to all live. If I'm saying I'm a Christian, but I'm not living that way, I'm in effect denying the very one that I'm trying to uphold. Come on, really? I got to be committed. I've got to be committed to the process of that growth. I've got to be committed to sharing with others. I've got to be committed to faithfulness. And faithfulness isn't just in the words that I say, it's in the life that I live. Now, we've had a text all year that we've centered a lot of our lessons on. It's Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. It, it's fitting here as well. The text says that Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. As we've said many times, yeah, Ezra, he was a scribe, a great student of God. He undoubtedly knew the word of God better than perhaps anybody of his time, perhaps even memorized that word. But he didn't stop there. He wasn't just an encyclopedia of the word of God. He shared that with everybody else. He lived a life of faithfulness, not just in word, but in deed as well. Let me tell you something. It, it is a great responsibility that we have to be spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world in which we live today. And the world's problems are mounting. You know what the solution to those problems is? It's the very thing that we promote, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can be a part of the solution. After all, as Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege, the opportunity this morning to be able to study together your word. And not just for the of the purpose of growing intellectually. It is a time of worship for us. So, Father, I pray that we have been touched in our spirits with your word here today. Lord, challenge us with this word written on our hearts to be more committed than ever. Help us, Father, to be committed to the process of growth. Help us to be committed to share with others. And help us, Father, to be committed in our faithfulness. You are so good to us. Give us the courage to demonstrate our thankfulness by the life that we are living. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you so much for joining us today for this period of worship with Somerdale Church of Christ. We hope it's been a blessing to you, and we would love to hear from you. You're welcome to write to us at the address here on the screen. You can email us, or you can check out more information at somerdalechurch.org. Go to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and look at our social media sites as well to find out what we're doing in our local community. Throughout the week, we have various opportunities for you to continue in your Bible study. Uh, Ken Forrest, our minister, does a brief Tuesday devotional that will encourage you, and you can check that out on his Facebook page or on our church Facebook page. We also have a midweek study led by our minister, Ken Forrest, on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, we have Billy Lambert, who is the host of the Getting to Know Your Bible program that does a brief devotional called Spiritual Uplift at 10 o'clock every Thursday. If you have missed Sunshine Studies today, you can go back and view it here on this YouTube page. And we do that every Sunday. We'll continue that for several weeks because we will not be assembling for Bible classes for a little while. Also, along with that, I mentioned Billy Lambert a moment ago with the Spiritual Uplift class. And you've got to check out Getting to Know Your Bible. Here on the screen, you'll see various ways that you can listen to the program or you can watch the program live on the Cowboy Channel and on Daystar. Of course, we're on all the social media platforms as well. And we do podcasting. So go to SoundCloud, Anchor, Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, whatever podcast platform you use, and listen to Getting to Know Your Bible. If you'd be interested in receiving a free Bible correspondence course, you can write to the address here on the screen or call 1-877-711-5214. And more information is at gettingtoknowyourbible.com. For our youth, remember junior week and middle school and high school week, you're going to need to sign up at gulfcoastbiblecamp.com. At the point in which this particular uh, worship service was recorded, we still are planning on having a Bible camp in July. If that changes, we'll make sure and let all of you know. Thank you so much again for tuning in and being a part of our service today. We hope that you will continue to watch these programs and join us if you're in our community. We'd love to meet with you again next Sunday morning. We'll meet at 10 a.m. for worship only in our fellowship hall here at the Somerdale Church of Christ. Be blessed and remember the Lord loves you and so does the Somerdale Church of Christ.